it's 8 o'clock and uh, welcome to another episode of uh, marvelous medicine today is about the latest guidelines of the survive, surviving sepsis campaign and the speaker is dr jose chako he is a senior consultant and head critical care and emergency services at uh, narayana health bangalore his areas of interest are echocardiographic optimization of hemodynamic status ultrasonography in critical care renal replacement therapy and management of refractory hypoxia he is on the editorial board of indian journal of critical care medicine he has several publications in peer reviewed journals and has contributed to textbooks in critical care and emergency medicine anyone who is part of the critical care scenario in india will definitely know dr jose chako and his blog criticalcareblogspot.com where he makes all the recent advances in critical care easy to understand even for non critical care specialists his podcasts are great to listen and uh, you can hear them at criticalcareedu.com.au over to you um, uh, let me also introduce doc, uh, the moderator dr v sabanaigam he is the clinical lead of the multidisciplinary icu at mgm hospital chennai he did his mbbs and da from stanley medical college followed by fellowship at the college of anesthetists royal college of surgeons in ireland and he is also the european diplomat of intensive care he did his intensive care training in sydney australia and his areas of interest are ecmo mechanical cardiovascular support and regional anesthesia we have dr suchitra ranjit again this week she is the senior consultant and head of pediatric icu at apollo children's hospital chennai she did her mbbs from afmc pune and her md pediatrics from calicut Her pediatric intensive care and neonatal intensive care training was in Melbourne and Sydney, and her cardiac intensive care training was at Madras Medical Mission, Chennai. Her areas of interest are improving outcomes of septic shock and severe dengue. She has over sixty publications in national and international journals, including several papers on management of uh, pediatric septic shock. Her manual of pediatric emergencies and critical care is widely used by residents. She is the Asian representative in the World Federation of Pediatric and Intensive Care Societies and is a task force member of the Pediatric Surviving Sepsis Campaign. Over to you, Dr. Chakra. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Vidya, for that introduction. Really appreciate you inviting me to this meeting. So, My over pleasure. the last over the last couple of years, we've been through a really torrid time with covid-19 affecting our lives in an unprecedented manner according to the latest numbers roughly 5 million people have died due to covid across the world and our numbers in india suggest close to 5 lakh people have died from covid now if you look at sepsis the mortality from sepsis is much higher the latest numbers suggest that roughly 11 million people die of sepsis every year so clearly we have a, a real problem in our hands in fact this problem has been lingering around for a very long time indeed and it's because of this very high mortality from sepsis that the surviving sepsis campaign was launched about 20 years ago and they set out to try to ease things for the clinician by the bedside by offering some guidelines general very broad guidelines on how best to handle patients with sepsis in the critical care unit and along with that we had the task force which came up with the surviving sepsis guidelines the first edition of these guidelines were published in 2004 subsequently they have been revising these guidelines every four yearly and the last guideline was delayed because of covid-19 and it was published just a few months ago so as i mentioned these guidelines have been of great use to clinicians particularly novices trainees in critical care medicine where they are faced with a difficult situation as to refer to 
and carry out whatever inter interventions may be more appropriate in a difficult situation when they face patients with severe sepsis. Having said that, there are a lot of moot points in the surviving sepsis guidelines over the years. It has been the subject of a lot of criticism too from many quarters because we really do not have very strong, robust evidence for many of those recommendations. And the authors themselves admit that the evidence is flimsy in regard to many of those recommendations. And some of these recommendations at least is based on expert opinion and consensus. So given the situation, we would, over the course of this presentation, look at some of the points wherein there is more than one opinion, and perhaps we could modify uh, in terms of optimizing patient care and offering individualized patient care by the bedside. It's very important to be able to diagnose sepsis early. Diagnosis means you need to identify patients with severe sepsis and offer them appropriate care early enough. It makes a huge difference in terms of outcomes if you act expeditiously or if you delay things and delay, as we all know, can cause can lead to poor outcomes. Several screening tools have been used to try to identify sepsis, particularly in the emergency department or maybe in the wards when patients deteriorate because of infections. And these scoring systems used over the years have been the modified early warning score or the MUSE, the national early warning score or the MUSE. People have used the SERS criteria, which are not used very much anymore. So these are some of the scoring systems that have been used to identify patients as having sepsis and initiate early appropriate management. And then in 2016, we had the International Consensus Committee Task Force on the Definitions of Sepsis come up with a, a new scoring system to identify early sepsis. And that was actually the Q SOFA, which is an abbreviated form of the SOFA score, including just three criteria. It was meant to be a simplistic approach that is easy to carry out by the bedside and allow the clinician to identify sepsis early and initiate management early. And the three criteria that are included in the Q SOFA were one, respiratory rate of more than 22 per minute, altered sensorium, again, one point, or systolic blood pressure equal to or less than 100 millimeters of mercury. So each of these criteria would score one point and a score of two or three, three is of course the maximum score, suggested a poor outcome from sepsis. So the surviving sepsis committee looked at these criteria on the basis of whatever little evidence they had. There were a few observational studies, nothing much to go by, but from whatever they could gather from these observational studies, it looked like the Q so far did not really work well as a screening tool. A screening tool must be robust enough to cast the net wide and catch as many patients as possible who have sepsis. So that's the idea behind using a screening tool. In other words, you should not miss out on a possible case of sepsis or the possibility of missing out should be low. In other words, it should be a sensitive tool. And that's where Q so far seemed to fail. It simply seemed to be not sensitive enough to diagnose sepsis, although it was specific the specificity was high, and patients with high Q so far had a poor outcome. But as a screening tool, it did not play up to the promise that it had it initially had. So that's the reason why 
We need a good screening tool with good sensitivity and the queue so far, although it is a simplified approach, seemed to fail. And the, and the surviving sepsis campaign have recommended against its use, understandably so. The next question, a very controversial question, which has been asked, raised several times, is the recommendation to use lactate levels as a guide to initial resuscitation in sepsis. Even the latest iteration of the surviving sepsis guidelines suggest that you target resuscitation interventions to ensure that the lactate levels decrease over time. This is a contentious issue and we will look at it in some detail. First of all, the assumption that lactate levels rise in sepsis because of a failure in oxygen delivery cannot be true. Because in most cases of sepsis, especially in the early phase of sepsis, we know that the cardiac output is high, oxygen delivery is maintained or even high, and anaerobic metabolism leading to lactate production is highly unlikely. And that's what the evidence that we have has suggested so far as well. So the lactate levels in sepsis are not an indicator of the extent of anaerobic metabolism and the failure to deliver enough oxygen to the tissues. So that much is pretty certain. So if that is so, why would you need to target lactate levels and try to enhance oxygen delivery in a situation where the delivery is already okay? The next question would be, if it is not due to anaerobic metabolism, where does the lactate come from in patients with sepsis? One of the most important reasons for the rise of lactate levels in sepsis is increased adrenergic stimulation that you see in sepsis, like with any other stressful condition, particularly in sepsis. Glucose transporters play work over time and they transport glucose with, into the cell. And because of the high glucose transport, the glucose of course gets converted to pyruvate through different pathways. And the pyruvate would normally get converted to acetyl-CoA through the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase. And the acetyl-CoA gets converted to 38 molecules of ATP through the citric acid cycle. So that's the normal pathway. That is good. That's the way it should be. But then what happens in sepsis? The pyruvate dehydrogenase becomes simply overwhelmed because of too much glucose, too much pyruvate, it just cannot handle so much of pyruvate. And the pyruvate begins to accumulate. So what happens to the pyruvate? Lactate dehydrogenase takes over and it converts the pyruvate to lactate. Now, this, as you can see, is not because of anaerobic metabolism. It is simply because aerobic metabolism is overwhelmed and there is excess pyruvate. The pyruvate dehydrogenase cannot handle it anymore. And the lactate dehydrogenase takes over and converts the pyruvate to lactate. Now this lactate is not necessarily harmful. It gets converted in the liver by gluconeogenesis to glucose. And even more importantly, the lactate is an important fuel for the brain and the heart, where it may get converted to pyruvate and then to acetyl-CoA and go through the citric acid cycle for the production of ATP. So instead of blaming the lactate on hypoxia, reduced oxygen delivery, and anaerobic metabolism, 
it is most important to realize that it is actually a defense mechanism and lactate may also act as a fuel as it shuttles through different organs and different tissues. Now, all that is very good. Does that really mean that if you target lactate levels, would it be disadvantageous or harmful? There are other sources of lactate production, including in the liver. Liver dysfunction very often happens as part of multi-organ dysfunction in sepsis, and that can lead to raised lactate levels. In ARDS, the lung may be an important source of excess lactate production. And then of course, it is possible that anaerobic metabolism may take over when things go rapidly downhill. And when your patient is in the late phase of sepsis, there is bioenergy failure, mitochondrial failure, and that results in anaerobic metabolism and lactate production. Although this is a late phenomenon, not at all a common phenomenon, most patients in sepsis have raised lactate levels, not because of anaerobic metabolism, as I mentioned before. So the question as to whether targeting lactate levels indeed is of any benefit or otherwise. Today, we have a reasonably strong evidence from the Andromeda shock trial. Andromeda, as you know, is our neighboring galaxy, roughly a billion light years away. But this trial, the Andromeda shock trial, has nothing to do with any galaxy. So they studied in a randomized controlled fashion two different methods of resuscitation or two different targets of resuscitation. In one group, they used capillary refill time as the target. They targeted a capillary refill time of three seconds. The way they did it was they placed a, a glass slide on the finger, pressed it hard, and then released it to see how much time does it take for the capillaries to refill. So capillary refill guided resuscitation was one of the arms. The target was three seconds or less. And on the other side, they targeted lactate levels as the surviving sepsis guidelines suggest. They looked at the 28-day mortality as a primary outcome. And they found in their initial study that the 28-day mortality was numerically higher among patients who had lactate-guided resuscitation compared to those who underwent capillary refill-guided resuscitation. This difference, the absolute difference, was about 9.5% in favor of capillary refill guided resuscitation. But unfortunately, it did not reach statistical significance, only because the authors had assumed a difference of 15%, which is a very large difference by any standards and unrealistic perhaps. And because of this large difference, the sample size became small and not really large enough perhaps leading to a type 2 error or a false negative result. So that was the original Andromeda shock trial. Then they performed a post hoc analysis and pub published it as a separate paper, wherein among patients who had normalized their capillary refill time, those who underwent further aggressive resuscitation to normalize lactate levels, they looked specifically at this group patients who had normalized their, uh, normalized their capillary refill times, but were randomized to the lactate guided group and kept on receiving resuscitative interventions to try to achieve normal lactate. So in this subgroup of patients who in spite of normal capillary refill times underwent further aggressive resuscitative measures to reach a lactate level of two or less, the mortality was significantly higher. So although this is only a post hoc result with all the limitations of a post hoc analysis, it is a fairly good piece of evidence. In fact, I would say the most, the strongest evidence that we have today 
that suggests that pursuance of resuscitative, resuscitative interventions, particularly bolusing of fluids, bolus after bolus after bolus, to try to normalize lactate levels is probably going to be counterproductive and lead to high mortality. In fact, Paul Merrick, one of the one of the eminent critical care physicians who has come up against this lactate targeted therapy, has even coined the term lactobolusing. Lactobolus means, especially trainees in ICU, whenever they see a slightly raised lactate of say three or slightly higher, they tend to give a bolus of fluid each time trying to normalize lactate levels. And all this fluid adds up shift after shift after shift of resonance and leads to literally drowning the patient in fluid. So that's something we should be careful about when you try to target lactate levels and, and pursue it as a sole target. The next contentious issue from the surviving sepsis guidelines is the question of how much fluid to use during the initial resuscitation phase in sepsis. They seem to suggest a bolus of 30 mils per kilogram, which will roughly come to two liters of fluid as a standard recommendation. Although this may be true in many patients, the whole question is, should we go by a one size fit all bolus volume in all comers with sepsis? That's an important question. If you look at the evidence, this particular study, the FEES trial, which many of you would be familiar with, was conducted in Sub-Saharan Africa, published 10 years ago, but it remains a landmark trial. Maitland et al. They studied children. Of course, it was not in adults. But in a very interesting study, they compared fluid resuscitation versus no fluid resuscitation in the initial care of children who presented with impaired perfusion. They, it was a three-arm study. They used 5% albumin or saline in a dose of 20 to 30 mils per kilogram and compared with no fluid at all. And what they found was quite profoundly interesting to say the least. They found that the mortality was significantly higher among children who received fluid resuscitation compared to those who did not receive fluid resuscitation. Of course, there are several points here that one would like to raise. First, it is not an adult study. It is a, a study in the pediatric age group. Second, the study was carried out in relatively impoverished countries in Africa, where the level of care may not be comparable to more developed parts of the world. And also many of these intensive care units did not even have the facility to intubate and ventilate their patients. So it may not be strictly applicable, but, but still, it's a very important finding that fluid resuscitation compared to no resuscitation in these children resulted in worse outcomes. So I'm not suggesting here that you should not resuscitate your septic patients, but it is something that is worth thinking about when you go all gaga about fluid bolus after fluid bolus after fluid bolus in your septic patients. So what are the possible harmful effects of a, a liberal fluid resuscitation strategy? Fluid overload is one of the major problems as several studies have shown so far. The FACT trial, the VAST trial, which compared vasopressin versus noradrenaline. They all showed that the cumulative fluid balance over the first few days may decide the outcome in patients with sepsis and septic shock. Excess fluid raises venous pressures. Of course, you go by the CVP and aim a target CVP and it's very easy to overload them. Raised venous pressures are bad because as you know, perfusion pressure of any organ 
depends on the mean arterial pressure upstream minus the venous pressure downstream. For instance, the kidneys, if you raise the venous pressure too high, the driving pressure or the perfusion pressure will, of course, be low, and that will reduce renal perfusion. So that's one of the problems. Second, even more important, is the vasodilatory stage that can result with excess fluid. A vasodilatory state might seem counterintuitive, but it does happen. Why does it happen? Excess fluid inhibits the baroreceptor reflex and the reflex vasoconstriction that you see in shock, and that may reduce blood pressure. Second, too much fluid would stretch the stretch receptors in the right atrium, and that results in the release of maturity peptides, which are vasodilators and may cause hypotension. Third, too much of fluid causes nitric oxide release, a potent vasodilator, and result in a vasodilated state. So these are the putative mechanisms by which too much fluid can harm. On the other hand, if you restrict your initial fluid resuscitation, give a more modest fluid resuscitation, and then use vasopressors early, that might be more optimal. Because as we know, the primary problem in sepsis is of vasodilatation. Not many patients have a real fluid deficit to begin with, to require fluid bolus after fluid bolus. The problem is vasodilatation. And if you can overcome this vasodilatation with vasoconstrictors, that may be enough in many of these patients. Second, Vasopressors like noradrenaline, they do not just cause arterial constriction. They constrict the venous side of the circulation. And by constricting the veins, they improve the venous return, improve the preload to the heart, and improve cardiac output as well. So the cardiac output rises, there is reversal of vasoconstriction, and both these combined will result in improved perfusion to various organs. So that's all the more reason why you should aim for early vasopressors after a modest initial fluid bolus. Another very important question is what type of fluid would you use? I remember several years ago, by default, we would use normal saline in all our patients. And over the years, there is very strong evidence that has accumulated to suggest possible harmful effects from normal saline. Now, what is the harmful effect of normal saline? As we know, normal saline contains sodium of 154 millimoles per liter and chloride of 154 mils, millimoles per liter. Now, if you give a solution with an equal strength of sodium and equal strength of chloride, it results in relative hyperchloremia. And hyperchloremia can lead to several problems. First, it can cause a metabolic acidosis. And second, it can impair renal function. We will look at the mechanism as well as to how it may cause. How does it cause impaired renal function? Because of excess chloride, because of excess filtered chloride through the glomeruli, the distal convoluted tubule will have an increased chloride content. And that results in stimulation of the juxtaglomerular cells, resulting in afferent arteriolar constriction. Constriction of the afferent arteriole will reduce the perfusion, the glomerular filtration pressure, and reduce glomerular filtration. So that is the mechanism by which hyperchloremia results in, in afferent arterial construction, uh, constriction and impaired renal perfusion. So lactated ringers may be a much better option, mainly because the chloride content of ringers lactate solution is much lower at 109 millimoles per liter, much closer to that of plasma. Just briefly mention the Stewart hypothesis. If you go by the Stewart equation, you will clearly understand how does hyperchloremia 
cause metabolic acidosis. So that is the normal situation. If you look at the sodium level and the other cations, they should exactly balance the chloride and other anions, including bicarb. Electrical neutrality is most important. You have to have electrical neutrality. Now let us see what happens if you give normal saline. The chloride levels rise. And as the chloride levels rise, you have to get rid of some negative ions or anions from this equation. So what happens to the bicarb? The bicarb gets kicked out. And when the bicarb gets kicked out, you get a metabolic acidosis. So let's see mechanism behind metabolic acidosis from hyperchloremia. Do we have any evidence to suggest that normal saline is harmful in critically ill patients? We had two studies, the salt ed study from an emergency department in the US and the SMART study, again, from the same institution in the US that compared patients who received normal saline versus balanced crystalloid. They received either plasmalite or ringer lactate in the balanced crystalloid arm compared to normal saline. And they found in both these studies, one of the studies was in critically ill patients. The other study was in emergency patients who were not critically ill. And in both these studies, they found that clinical outcomes were better with the use of a balanced crystalloid, either lactated ringers or plasmalite. And normal saline was associated with poor clinical outcomes. Now, just recently, we had the BASICS randomized controlled trial in which they compared normal saline versus plasmalite across more than 60 centers in Brazil. And in fact, in this study, they found no difference in the mortality between normal saline and plasmalite. However, very important to realize that in this particular study, although it was a very large trial and they did very well in terms of recruiting patients in the middle of the COVID pandemic, they could not really achieve a difference in chloride levels between the two groups. There was hardly any difference between the chloride levels simply because the resuscitation fluids that they used were very much small compared to conventional volumes that we use underlying the fact that, that their patients may have been less severely ill. So less severely ill patients, less volume administered, less difference in the chloride levels between the two arms, and clearly chloride levels were not probably high enough to cause harm. So on the basis of the basics trial, we cannot say that normal saline is equivalent to balanced crystalloid. We should probably continue with the practice of using ringer lactate or plasmalite. Plasmalite perhaps doesn't have any special advantage over ring lactate and it is costly. So in most of our ICUs, I would strongly suggest ring lactate. Another important question, how soon do you need, need to give antibiotics in septic patients? There has been a lot of paranoia among emergency doctors and critically doctors and the question of to rush in with antibiotics and every minute of delay, every hour of delay, as one of the papers from Kumar et al. suggested a long time ago, seemed to suggest that the mortality keeps on rising exponentially with every second of delay in antibiotics. This is probably an exaggeration of what you see in real life. Perhaps the pharma industry also has some hand in it because it benefits them to if the clinicians use, clinicians indulge in profuse antibiotic use to all comers. The whole problem is if you start putting pressure on clinicians to administer antibiotics, they would give antibiotics to everybody who knocks at their door, regardless of whether they have sepsis or not, to make sure that they don't fail. And this, in fact, would lead to a lot of inappropriate, unnecessary antibiotic use, particularly in patients with other kinds of hypotension, let us say cardiogenic shock, or say pulmonary embolism, we'll all get antibiotics, as I think is the practice in many of our units. 
So, of course, if there is a reasonable suspicion, you would use antibiotics. But, but if at all you have the time, if at all your patients are relatively stable, it may be worthwhile to take a little bit of time to try to convince yourself, to try to establish the diagnosis of sepsis before you rush in with antibiotics. In fact, I came across this study published recently from the Netherlands in which they compared antibiotics administered by paramedics in the ambulance. You can't be more early than that compared to antibiotics administered in the emergency department. So when they analyze their patients, ambulance administration versus emergency department administration, in the early administration or the ambulance administration group, the patients received antibiotics 26 minutes before they reached the emergency department. And in the late group, or those patients who received antibiotics after they reached emergency, it took 70 minutes after they reached emergency for the first dose of antibiotics. But they did not find any difference in mortality at 28 days. It was 8% in both arms. So a study, a real world study that suggests that you need not rush in under all circumstances. And perhaps you can take a little bit of time to establish the diagnosis of infection, if at all there is a doubt. Would you use a single antibiotic or a combination of antibiotics? Again, the surviving sepsis guidelines suggest the use of combination in situations, of course, where there is a high incidence of resistance. Perhaps there are many situations in our ICUs in India where you would need to use a combination. But as a general rule, this is perhaps not the right thing to do. As is very well seen in this very clear meta-analysis, including more than 10 randomized controlled studies in which combination therapy was found to be no more beneficial than the use of a single antibiotic. Another very important question that we often ask in our units, how much oxygen is good? When would you say that it is too much oxygen? As we all know, oxygen is meant to be used as a drug. Too much of oxygen is bad because it is associated with the increased production of oxygen-free radicals, which can result in apoptosis of various organs and can exacerbate organ failures. That much is very much clear. Too much of a good thing is obviously bad, and that goes for oxygen too. There have been many studies, many randomized controlled trials in the recent past. And one of these, the N6 ICU ROC study, they studied 1,000 patients. These were general critically ill patients, not particularly septic patients. But out of those, they looked specifically at septic patients. In fact, in their general uh, study of all critically ill patients, they randomized their patients in the conservative oxygen therapy arm for a saturation of not more than 96%, 91 to 96. If it touched 97%, they would rapidly wind down their FiO2 levels and bring it down to 96 or below. And in the other arm, they use conventional saturation, which was 91 to anything up to 100%. So overall, they did not find any difference in the mortality, but on subgroup analysis, that they found that among septic patients, mortality at 180 days was higher in the conservative oxygen therapy arm compared to the usual arm. So that again, as I mentioned, is a subgroup analysis, not a definitive result, but it is something that you need to look at in future studies. The most important question of all questions, perhaps, is when would you consider it appropriate to transfer your patients to the ICU from the ward or from the emergency department, as the case may be? What may be the optimal time? As the clock ticks away, the guidelines suggest that you try six hours as your target. For many of our units, we may consider this to be too long, 
six hours is indeed too long. This, of course, depends on your circumstances, whether you have free ICU beds. Even in our setup at Narana, we may have to wait for sometimes even longer than six hours in septic patients. But ideally, you should transfer your patients within the first hour or two, not wait for an unduly long period of time. It depends on the skill level and the kind of care that you can offer at the emergency department as well. At the ward level, of course, in many of our hospitals, we won't be able to give appropriate care for septic patients. But as I mentioned, this depends on your individual situation. If you have free ICU beds, obviously, you would need to transfer them as quickly as possible. So to sum up, the quick so far score has been rightly suggested to be not the way to go by the surviving sepsis guidelines purely because it lacks sensitivity to identify sepsis. Lactate-guided resuscitation may be going a little too far, and if you keep on chasing down lactate levels with more and more fluid or more and more vasopressors, you can probably do harm to your patients. Common salt may be good, it adds flavor to most of the food that we eat, but normal saline may not be the ideal resuscitation fluid. A balanced crystalloid like Ringer's lactate or plasmalite is much more appropriate. Pushing antibiotics early may be appropriate if you are convinced with the diagnosis of sepsis, but in doubtful situations, if at all your patient can afford to wait for the first couple of hours, it may be worthwhile to evaluate your patient in detail and then be guided by what you find in terms of whether to go early with antibiotics or not. Combination therapy with antibiotics may not be the right answer always. If a little is good, it doesn't mean lots is better. In septic patients, perhaps we shouldn't go too far with cutting back on the FiO2 levels from the evidence we have from the ICU ROCS trial. Perhaps you can be a little more liberal until we have evidence to the contrary. Of course, we do admit that too much of a good thing is bad and too much oxygen can also be bad. And last but not the least, you would transfer your patients to the ICU from the emergency or from the ward as the case may be as early as possible. Thanks very much. We can initiate a discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dios Chako, for the lucid talk and uh, wonderful slides. Uh, over to you, Saba. You could uh, stop sharing your screen, sir. Uh, just a moment. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, as it is, we all know it is such an elaborate document and uh, you know, within the short uh, time that was uh, stipulated, you have actually highlighted all the important points and updates, um, especially simultaneously underscoring the strength and weakness of all the recommendations. And it's uh, also great that on, on one side, it was so informative and at the si other side, you also made it so light for us so that, you know, it just went like a song. It was not at all intense. Thank you so much. Um, especially the fact that about uh, the pathophysiology behind the increase in lactates and uh, while stressing the point that not to aim for a normal lactate, we're also stressing that, you know, uh, just aim for a decreasing trend, but normal, not normal lactates. That's uh, really uh, good, especially understanding the pathophysiology that it's not just from anaerobic metabolism. Uh, and again, with the fluid side, uh, you know, the phrases one side doesn't fit all. And uh, the fact that modest fluid resuscitation, which has to be uh, tailored for each and every patient. That's, again, one other thing. Um, thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure. Thank Over you. Dr. Sujit. Uh, <clears throat> congratulations, Dr. Chakro. Uh, I'll first start with... Uh, actually congratulating Vidya for conducting this very successful, very um, professionally conducted um, sessions every week with a lot of our 
our trainees also look forward to. So it's a nice medley of, um, of, uh, of subjects, sometimes even non-medical. So it's uh, well done with your great work. And uh, so I'm a pediatric intensivist and um, I have to have some, I mean, it's a disclosure. So, uh, but there's many parts of treating pediatric sepsis which are very similar to adult sepsis. And um, it's great that uh, uh, pediatricians such as Kate Maitland uh, created ripples which had repercussions on both adult practice and pediatric practice with her um, feet study. So um, our group uh, has been doing quite a lot of uh, septic shock research as well. And, as, and um, uh, one of the, and one, and two of the papers uh, were very related to what you said, Dr. Chako. One was about the fluids causing vasodilatation. So the most recent uh, paper, which came out earlier this year in Pediatric Critical Care Medicine Journal, showed that we actually joined forces with Dr. Monge Garcia, who, who demonstrated, he's a Spanish researcher, adult researcher, who initially demonstrated that the map can fall after fluid bolus in adult patients with septic shock. He published in, in Cancer Care Medicine Journal. And uh, we were seeing the same thing in our patients when we gave fluid Sometimes their uh, pulses and uh, perfusion improved, but the MAP used to fall, and they used to actually need higher doses of pressors. So uh, we invited him to join our study and uh, published, and we could show that um, just improving cardiac output and oxygen delivery is not the only goal. You also needed to assure a good MAP because MAP determines organ perfusion <coughs> pressure and uh, so the, it's the upstream pressure that determines the organ perfusion pressure. And, it, and further, if the diastolic VP also were to fall, then the diastolic is the upstream pressure for the heart. So the sudden deaths that Kat Maitland demonstrated in her, the group which got, got 40 ml per kg fluids, uh, she, she clearly said it wasn't fluid overload, it was a cardiac death. So. I mean, there were several hypotheses, but nobody's really sure. The second study that we did again, which resonates with what you described was about the fact that we compared patients who got early norepinephrine after 10 or 20 ml per kg flow. Remember that in children, the recommendation at the time was 60 ml per kg fluid. That means 20 plus 20 plus 20 given in 15 minutes which makes the adult recommendation of 30 mils per kg in three hours seem so easy to achieve. So this was terrible because all these patients, they were just huffing and puffing with a little bit of poor uh, perfusion. And then we had to push, push, push fluid according to guidelines and all of them needed, needed ventilation. So working in Apollo, it was a little hard because they had so much of a you know, financial problem. We looked as if, to treat the sepsis, we landed up putting them on ventilators. So we could show that early norepinephrine after 10 or 20 ml per kg fluid restore perfusion very nicely, not just the blood pressure, but also the cardiac output without any increase in uh, renal failure or acidosis. And the mortality was same in both groups. But the days in the ICU days require, I mean, on ventilator, and the fluid was remarkably less. So it was, uh, I mean, it's great that our pediatric study resonates with what you said as well. So I think that's all I have to say. Now, what you said is very true, which we see in our day-to-day -day practice as well. Many of our patients end up getting too much fluid. And uh, we all know that beyond a certain stage, it doesn't really achieve any purpose. Of course, it does make sense during the initial phase you do, give fluid, particularly to patients who may be hypovolemic. They do require fluid. But in general terms, if you keep on giving bolus after bolus, it all adds up and finally ends up in the lung, causes uh, edema in other organs as well. And that can very clearly lead to adverse outcomes. And that's a situation in which you would not only curtail the use of fluid, but perhaps once you attain stability, you would use some 
diuretic to try to take out the fluid. And uh, perhaps even renal replacement therapy by the time, uh, if the kidneys have failed, you try to do CRRT and fluid removal. So it is, of course, uh, called de-resuscitation, the practice of trying to remove fluid through diuretics or CRRT as the case may be. So in fact, I remember reading a paper by Baloma et al, who's also been a staunch critic of excessive fluid in which uh, he's, he suggests that the actual response to Ebola's fluid with increase in blood pressure is very, very uncommon. Most patients do not increase blood pressures or perfusion pressures merely by giving fluid. And that is a very strong case to start vasopressors early. You need perfusion pressures, as you rightly pointed out. And there is no better way than to begin initiate, research, initiate treatment with a vasoconstrictor. Noradrenaline is what we have. And, uh, and hand in hand, you can administer fluids if it is appropriate. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Ghosh, who's an internist at uh, Mayo. Uh, Ghosh, you wanted to say something about ruling in and ruling out diagnosis of sepsis. So first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Chakra and Dr. Renji for the amazing uh, concepts and, and um, truly really excellent summary of what we know. What I really want to compliment is two things which I learned from our critical intensivist is that we are always in the process of discovery in um, medicine. There's very, very few things we invent. But the nature already knows what the best course for the body is, like uh, Dr. Chakro mentioned about the, uh, the pluses and the minuses of how to deal with lactate. And we are trying to figure it out with studies. What is most challenging for an uh, intensivist, and they have taught us exactly with lectures like that, is that the body is a very complex uh, system. It's a, and they have introduced complexity into medicine by calling, introducing a term called complex adapted system, where uh, you cannot look at only one thing. You cannot look at just the blood pressure or oxygen or MAP. You have to look at the whole thing uh, as it is. So all these courses which have come up so far and others have been an attempt to do that. And, and the game is over uh, even before it starts. So the entire team has to be extremely disciplined, know what the recent guidelines are, know all the, uh, there is not much of trial and error you can do. In fact, that is what we did when we were in training in Jipmer and Chandigarh, where I trained where all these studies were not there, trying to give saline and cause acidosis and cause a lot of problem. Fortunately, with all the studies with Dr. Chako mentioned and uh, Dr. Ranjit mentioned, things are improving. Uh, so understanding that the critical care is an area of supportive medicine, that the patient will get better on its own once these systems start working. And we in the critical care are supporting them with, with whatever knowledge we have uh, in the best way of providing oxygen, food, uh, electrolyte imbalance, fluid electrolyte imbalance, all these things are very essential. And having the trainees understand that, that it's a bundle kind of a thing, whether it's an infection bundle or fluid bundle, that uh, we are in the supportive role. Sometimes they get into very much into that I am it um, and, and not understanding what the body is trying to send the message. And it becomes counterintuitive, which Dr. Chako showed so beautifully in almost all the slides from antibiotic giving to uh, lactate management, fluid management. And that is what uh, we are learning now. I don't think that the last uh, word is out yet um, because a lot of these things have become very complicated with COVID. Imagining having to do this uh, with putting your PPE mask and using remote monitoring system but thankfully to ICU all over, at least in Mayo, what we have done is we have with telehealth, we've been able to reach Middle East and other countries, being able to really help them uh, because of the similar understanding of complex understanding system. But it really takes somebody like Dr. Chako to bring this forward periodically. Uh, these kind of updates have to be done probably on a yearly basis. Uh, number one, to say what's going on um, in the field. Number two, uh, to improve all the, uh, the old information which we have, which is really not right, which is more of a, uh, 
common sense approach of uh, try to fix fix things. Uh, and this action-oriented fixing thing sometimes does not work very well in ICU setting as Dr. Chakra just mentioned. So I really congratulate you. Uh, number one, in your ability to bring slides uh, in a way uh, that all learners and many of us learn very well with uh, visual rather than just uh, auditory. And you use both techniques to really um, and kind of educate all of us. Thank you for that. So coming to the spin in and spin out, what Dr. Chako said, there is this thing called, it is snout, it is S-E-N for sensitivity, N, capital N and O, which means if the test is highly sensitive and you have a negative test, it rules out the diagnosis. Same thing with spin in, it's S-P-P-I-N. If the test has high specificity and the test is positive, it rules in. So high specific tests are important for, rule of, for ruling in diagnosis and <clears throat> screening tests as Dr. Uh, Chaco said is not going to work because you have to have a, imagine using the snout. If there's a test that's high sensitivity and you have a negative test, it will rule out the diagnosis, um, not rule in. So that is important to keep these two terms uh, because it gets confusing when we use uh, these terms as to what are we trying to do uh, so based on what kind of test you want to do in the outpatient or in the inpatient, you have to know the characteristics of the, of the test. And one of the things which has gone beyond is the likelihood ratio, uh, which really helps, which takes both these parameters and it's got one number and the likelihood ratio is five, six, 10, it kind of rules in. The likelihood ratio is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, it rules out. So, but thank you again uh, for this wonderful lecture. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that. We have questions um, from the audience. There is one question in the chat. Can I uh, just read that out? Yes, please. So there's a question from Dr. Anand probably. Strategies for septic shock management in end-stage renal failure patients. Yes, of course, uh, in end-stage renal disease, <clears throat> Kidneys are not functional, of course, and uh, the whatever we mentioned about fluid fluid resuscitation would take a very play a very cru crucial role, as there is no way for the fluid to escape. And these patients, you should be doubly careful with the kind of fluid that you use and the volume of fluid that you use. And most importantly, you will have to initiate them on renal replacement therapy early to ensure that you are able to take off the excess fluid and also ensure that they don't fluid overload themselves in the lung or in the other organs as well. So it's a very uh, tricky situation at best of times, given the fact that the kidneys are non-functional and you need to be doubly cautious with initial suspicion and subsequent fluid management. Renal replacement therapy, will obviously have to commence early. And in, in this situation, uh, we would mostly prefer a continuous uh, therapy rather than intermittent therapies, which uh, they are used to in incisional disease. So, uh, so would you suggest any strategy for uh, deciding how much uh, fluid to give? I think that's what Dr. Anand is looking for. The volume of fluid, of course, will <clears throat> need to depend on several parameters, one of the, you need to assess volume responsiveness. That's a different topic, of course, very elaborate topic. There are different methodologies to assess volume responsiveness. So the basic requirement is to make sure that the, your patient is indeed volume responsive in some way. Giving fluid challenges without assessing volume responsiveness is not appropriate at all. So there are various methods people have been using. You can use pulse pressure variation, if you have a modality of measuring stroke volume, you can try stroke volume variation. And the passive leg raise test is a very important tool. You can do, you can measure stroke volume pre and post passive leg raise. And uh, in fact, if you're good with echocardiography, that's what we do routinely, you can assess the velocity time integral by the bedside, measure the velocity time integral or the stroke volume, and then 
do a passive leg raise before and after, do, do the uh, stroke volume measurement before and after passive leg raise and see if the stroke volume improves significantly. Most of these parameters, these are dynamic indices as you call them. Uh, if, you, if there is a sufficient change with the passive leg raise maneuver, it suggests that your patient may be volume responsive and give additional fluid. I think the same rules can apply to patients with ESRD as well. Many, many of my uh, trainees, especially juniors who are not very much used, they go entirely slavishly by the size of the inferior vena cava. This can be very misleading at times, particularly in patients who are spontaneously breathing, the IVC will collapse. IVC will collapse, especially if your patient is breathing vigorous spontaneous breath with each inspiratory effort in a patient who is not on ventilation, of course, breathing spontaneously, with each inspiratory effort, the IVC will collapse down. That doesn't mean that your patient is volume responsive. It is something similar to chasing down lactate levels. So you cannot chase down IVC collapsibility in that situation. You have to go by other indices like pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, bedside echocardiography, assess volume responsiveness, and then go by that. Very important to remember that even if your patient is volume responsive, it doesn't always mean that your patient actually requires volume because even normal subjects are on the rising part of the Starling curve. And if you give a bolus fluid to a normal person, cardiac output will increase. So that doesn't necessarily mean that he needs fluid. So the same rule should apply to your patient as well. Just because you believe your patient is volume responsive doesn't necessarily mean that you need to give volume. That depends on the holistic clinical picture, volume responsiveness, in addition to the, the peripheral warmth, capillary refill time, as well as the acid-based status, urine output among patients who have urine output in ESRD, of course, you can't go by that. So these are some of the indices to go by and individualized care to the patient by the bedside. Of course, that requires a bit of experience. That's where guidelines fail. Guidelines can only give you broad directions as to the line of care. It cannot specifically suggest what is the best strategy in a given patient, in a given situation. I hope that answers the question of both Anand and the uh, boss. <laughs> Do you want to take any of the other questions up there? Well, we have other questions coming up. Um, uh, there is one question which asks for the disadvantages of uh, ringer lactate, uh, Dr. Chako. Disadvantages of, of yes. ringer lactate. In septic patients, as a rule, ringer lactate is uh, definitely preferable to not in a normal saline as we have seen in many randomized controls so studies so far. The situation where it may not be uh, the ideal fluid is firstly in situations where the osmolality may be a problem. It can reduce the osmolality because it's a hypertonic solution. And this has been particularly shown to be harmful among patients who may have neurological or potential for neurological damage, especially in patients who are likely to have cerebral edema, traumatic brain injury and sepsis, for instance. If you use uh, relatively hypotonic solutions like Ringer's lactate, it might worsen cerebral edema. In that situation, normal saline may be preferable. Uh, so apart from situations like uh, that, as a general rule, you would go by Ringer lactate uh, potassium levels, people have been raising questions because ringer lactate contains four millimoles per liter of potassium. This doesn't really matter. Uh, it, it doesn't really cause hyperkalemia in clinical practice. First of all, because that level is not particularly high, four millimoles per liter. But even more importantly, if you give too much of normal saline, that is actually more likely to cause hyperkalemia than ringer lactate, purely because it may cause hyperchloremia and metabolic acidosis and potassium rise through the use of excessive normal saline. Ringer lactate, unless the potassium is lower than four, will not obviously result in an increase in potassium level. It can only lower the potassium level. So these are some of the questions that have been raised. But generally speaking, in 
patients with sepsis, normal saline is not the preferred fluid. You would prefer ringer lactate or plasmalite. This is based on whatever evidence we have so far as well. We have uh, one another, Dr. Kavita, who's uh, for patients with high sodium with metabolic alkalosis, what is the fluid of choice? High sodium and metabolic alkalosis. Is yeah. that what uh, the question yeah. is? Yeah. Yes, hypernatremia, high sodium, will result in a metabolic acidosis, provided the chloride levels are not high hand in hand. So just rise of sodium alone without a proportionate rise in the chloride levels will cause a metabolic uh, alkalosis. So, so in these patients, if there is hypernatremia, obviously you would uh, prefer 5% glucose if it is uh, high enough to be causing clinical problems. I try to bring down the sodium level as quickly as possible, or you might use half normal saline. And in many patients, all you need to do is probably use uh, enteral water administration. So it depends on the, the circumstance and the holistic approach in an individual situation. But generally speaking, 5% uh, dextrose or half normal saline may be appropriate in these patients. And as I mentioned, it does give rise to a metabolic alkalosis if the chloride levels are not commensurately high. I hope that answers the question. I, I guess so. I think, I think you have answered, uh, Dr. Shackle. Um, there's a couple of more questions. Um, how early can we follow procalcitonin for sepsis? How uh, early can we follow yes. procalcitonin? Uh, how, uh, how early would procalcitonin rise? It's a difficult question to answer. Uh, and the whole question of whether biomarkers are indeed useful in guiding therapy in sepsis is also uh, questionable. It depends on your turnaround time as well as to how, how much time. If you're really looking for a diagnosis of sepsis with procalcitonin, uh, in, in the acute scenario, of course, in a patient with, say, a multi-organ failure, it may not be appropriate to do so. But... Uh, there is some evidence that it might help with uh, later care in terms of winding back on your antibiotic therapy, cutting down the duration of antibiotic therapy or de-escalation of antibiotic therapy and so on. But as to the actual diagnosis of sepsis and to initiate treatment of sepsis based on procalcitonin level, perhaps the evidence is not strong enough at this point is what I would say. Thanks, Dr. Chako. Just going back to this initiation of antibiotics, uh, Dr. Chako, you you did mention that uh, uh, this one hour uh, uh, of rushing for an antibiotic within the first hour is not um, mandatory for all patients uh, unless there is a clear-cut evidence of sepsis. I just wanted to ask your um, uh, idea about how do you identify these patients in the, um, uh, in the clinical setting uh, for whom you would recommend antibiotics? Is it based on procalcitonin or is it based on the clinical? It will be largely based on the clinical mm -hmm. picture plus basic investigations. Like if you you can diagnose pneumonia fairly quickly with a bedside x-ray or ultrasonography. Uh, if you have a, a, a source that is very clear cut like urosepsis in an elderly person who had previous episodes of urosepsis, that again would be an obvious uh, diagnosis. Then, uh, of course, soft tissue infection, cellulitis, diabetic patients, all these would be risk factors. And you would, of course, err on the side of uh, safety and uh, being too early uh, would not uh, really matter in that, in that situation. But it's only in circumstances where, whether, the, whether the diagnosis is not clear cut first. And secondly, there is no organ dysfunction or there is no imminent organ dysfunction. You can afford to wait for a little bit of time. No metabolic acidosis, urine output is good. Blood pressure is reasonably okay. It's in that situation that you would perhaps not rush in. Uh, there is a, a tendency for many emergency units, which I've seen over the years, to give kef drags on to all comers through the door. This obviously is not an acceptable strategy, I feel. So it depends on the strength of the suspicion. 
the presence of a possible source of infection, and plus whatever investigation that is available by the bedside, including a, a chest X-ray, bedside ultrasonography, all these would strengthen your suspicion of sepsis and, and uh, enable early antibiotic administration. I understand. And when, and when the clinical picture is almost certain that it's a sepsis, but when the procal is not elevated, would you still uh, go ahead and give the antibiotic? Just uh, Again, a difficult question to answer because I don't use uh, procalcitonin levels in that situation. But generally speaking, I would go by my clinical hunch and uh, carry on with antibiotic treatment uh, rather than vacillate and uh, wait. Absolutely. I got it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's uh, one other question. Because Ringer's lactate contains calcium, can we use it as a vehicle for drugs without fear of precipitation? Uh, there are some drugs, of course, which will precipitate. Soda bicarb is an obvious uh, example. But uh, otherwise, most of the drugs that you would immediately need to use in a situation of sepsis or in patients who need fluid resuscitation are compatible with things like it is uh, my understanding. I think cephalosporins are one other group which probably are not compatible with Ringus lactate, to my knowledge. Okay. There was an earlier question about is the source of excess nitric oxide with fluid overload enos? Yes. Yes. Yeah, too much fluid can cause excess. Uh, nitric oxide release from the endothelium. That's one of the at least putative mechanisms behind the possible vasodilatory state in, in patients who receive excessive fluid in sepsis. Apart from the other mechanisms that I mentioned uh, involving the release of nitrific peps, uh, peptides uh, and the inhibition of the viral receptor reflex. These are uh, not absolutely proven in real life, but uh, largely based on experimental evidence. If uh, anyone else has any uh, questions, please uh, you feel free to unmute yourself and ask if you haven't already uh, typed it in the chat box. And there's another last question of a role of pulinostatin in sepsis, particularly community acquired pneumonia. I'm afraid I have no experience with its use. Uh, I have come across people who use it and I'm aware of one study that has addressed this question long time ago, but in contemporary practice, I'm not sure if it really has a role or not. Perhaps others in the panel would be able to answer. So, I mean, um, my experience is restricted to pancreatitis and burns. Uh, I haven't used it beyond uh, those two conditions. I haven't used it in sepsis at this time. Uh, Sabha, would you like to uh, share your experience of managing sepsis patients during the uh, pandemic, either patients with COVID and uh, sepsis from other uh, causes or uh, trying to manage two problems at the same time? Mm, absolutely. Um, uh, we found that, uh, unfortunately, the severe COVID patients who ended up in the intensive care unit uh, a lot of them who got intubated, unfortunately, developed a ventilator-associated pneumonia. And um, um, for probably for a few reasons, A, their immune system was badly affected. That's one thing. And secondly, the lungs were badly damaged. Most of the times, the infections were quite severe, refractory to the regular antibiotics. And a lot of them were uh, MDRs, uh, CREs mostly. Um, very difficult to treat, uh, proning. We, there was lots of usage of uh, high-end antibiotics, like never before usage of cholestin-based therapy and uh, uh, those drugs which we were uh, not sure, especially drugs like um, keftazidum, avibactam, and astrionum, those drugs which we which would rarely use, you know, they are quite commonly used during the COVID times. Um, it was it was quite bad. Lots of uh, ventilator-associated pneumonias, mostly restricted to the lungs. And um, uh, yes, of course, we did use lots of NIVs and BiPAPs. And uh, it's quite interesting that we did not have that sort of gaps with the, those patients. It is mostly those ones who are intubated. And, um, and uh, we lost quite young patients because of these gaps. These were patients who were 
almost coming out of the COVID, but we had to lose them for uh, bacterial pneumonias. Um, Dr. Suchitra, would you like to uh, mention anything specific about managing sepsis in pediatric patients? Dr. Suchitra? Yeah. So, uh, uh, it's really, I, I already, I mean, um, basically what I already said that uh, we really need to be more careful with fluids like Dr. Chako alluded to, sepsis is not a primary hypovolemic state. It's just a question of the fluid being in the wrong place. Certainly some of them um, may have a little, some vomiting, etc. cetera. So about, I mean, we are moving to less and less and very early vasopressors given via peripheral line. And we have a rule in our unit. If they still need the norepi, after six hours, um, I mean, at the end of six hours, the anorepis are just stopped or changed to a central line. So it works very, very well, very simple because their perfusion and blood pressure stabilize very quickly. We haven't hydrogenically drowned them and um, they just fly out to the ICU. The primary problem is sorted. So, I mean, I think it's just becoming so much more simpler. And I would say the whole reason why in our unit we use any fluid, whether it's saline or Ringer's lactate or anything, simply because we use so little of fluid, so it just doesn't matter. And uh, the chloride also doesn't go up, even if you use saline, it's just, just a 10 ml per kg, which hardly makes a difference. So it's only in the patients whose chloride, who get a wide anion gap acidosis that we consider the balanced solution. So, um, Radha Krishna, I, uh, nothing much has been discussed about uh, surgical patients and sepsis. So, do you have any questions? <clears throat> Thanks, Vidya. Yeah, at the outset, uh, uh, as a surgeon, a GI surgeon uh, dealing with uh, uh, patients with uh, considerable abdominal sepsis, uh, I think I should use this platform to thank our intensivists primarily for taking care of the patients and not just the taking care of the relatives, which is a very difficult thing. You know, they take the pressure out of us and uh, they take complete responsibility for the patients and keep talking and the patient ladies are uh, keen on listening to the intensives than the treating surgeons. Having said that, in uh, today's lecture, although, you know, I mean, I could get the gist of it uh, about the uh, futility of using normal saline and early antibiotics and monitoring lactate levels and oxygen usage, etc. I could get the sort of gist of what because generally surgeons are a little sort of immune to all these things. And, uh, you know, uh, but then the only thing that worries me is the figure which uh, Dr. Chaco has shown that uh, 11 million people die of sepsis. Um, is it that uh, a good number of them can be saved or a good, no good number of the sepsis can be prevented? What is the role of surgeon drainage? Because uh, if we can improve that number, I think uh, we have gained something. Uh, Dr. Chako. Yeah, what you say is uh, very right. One of the most important facets of sepsis control is, of course, to, to hit the source. And that's where surgeons, of course, come into the picture. Uh, you play the most important role there. The life, you're the lifesaver in that situation because no amount of antibiotics, no amount of resuscitation will really work unless you take away the source of sepsis. Particularly abdominal sepsis can be very deceptive and you need to keep your eye open for it. Things like uh, cholecystitis can be very elusive. Uh, a calculus cholecystitis can arise in, in patients who are, who are on life support for other reasons in ICU. So this is a situation in which you need to keep the eye open and surgeons play a very important role in source control. And as I mentioned, without source control, there is no winning this battle against sepsis. So if I may ask a question, I mean, Radha brought a very good uh, question, which I was going to ask. Uh, we use the word in intensivist in India. Is there a specific discipline, residency fellowship, or a whole group of uh, specialists are specializing in and calling themselves intensivists. And number two, do we have enough for the country? We now know what the burden of uh, 
illnesses, if there's 11 million without COVID, I'm sure the number has gone up. And this is a policy decision as, as a member of a critical care society, are there efforts to improve and increase the number of people who want to join the discipline? Sorry, it's a loaded question. Yeah, there are training programs in critical care. There are many different courses and the big corporate hospitals in cities, of course, you have trainees, you have qualified intensivists and uh, good intensive care facilities. But this is highly variable, as you may know. Uh, it depends on the location, uh, which city you are in, which uh, rural area you are in. And uh, it, there is a, uh, I'm, I'm sure there is a, a lot of non-uniformity of care. And there are many patients who would suffer because of it. Uh, I mean, in regard to the number of intensivists, of course, we are desperately short, uh, much, much fewer than the actual need. Uh, we saw it very clearly during the COVID pandemic. Hopefully it won't strike us again, but it's a, a very important point you bring out. And uh, we've been really struggling in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Uh, right now, we are a little better prepared, but if, it's, if, a, if a third wave hits us like it did during the second wave, we are again going to be in deep trouble. Uh, Nala, you wanted to say something? Thanks, Dr. Jose. That was a <clears throat> lovely, le <clears throat> lovely lecture. I just wanted to ask about um, when you have post-operative sepsis, like what Pata was talking about, in patients who are, say, 200 kg or 60 BMI, does the fluid management vary or how does it play with, unlike what Ranjit was talking about, uh, pediatric patients. And the second thing is that uh, uh, if you have a facility for fresh frozen plasma in your, uh, in your, in your uh, uh, hospital, do you think that will be also a very useful fluid to be used as a, in the management of sepsis in such obese patients? But that's what I felt was a difference. Uh, the first question, would the bolus of fluid that you use be based on the actual body weight of the patient? Uh, that is obviously going a bit too far because uh, I've come across several discussions on this particular point. In fact, uh, if your patient is, say, 150 kilograms, and if you're giving 20 mils per kilogram, uh, that will be three liters in one go, which is obviously going to be a lot of fluid. So... Here again, you need to individualize the response to the initial therapy that you use and not, and not just go by the, uh, the, the body weight and actual volume based on the, the body weight of the patient. That's some, uh, you know, a situation where you have to tailor your, your dose of fluid, not based on the actual body weight of the patient, but depending on the clinical circumstances. Secondly, fresh frozen plasma. Uh, I wouldn't particularly use FFP to resuscitate patients in sepsis. Uh, I don't think this is the general practice uh, by most people. We would use crystalloids. <clears throat> of course, there have been study, studies with uh, albumin, 20% uh, albumin, as well as 4% albumin, 5% albumin and uh, synthetic colloids as well, but synthetic colloids obviously have been shown to be possibly harmful. Albumin, there is still an open question. We're not sure about it yet, but FFPs, uh, I don't think anybody has really embarked upon a large enough study to tell us if that is uh, going to be helpful. Intuitively, you might think that being a colloid, it will stay in the circulation and it might be helpful compared to crystalloid, but then that is just, uh, physiology, what happens in sepsis is uh, vastly different in terms of the breakdown of the, the capillary barrier, breakdown of the glycocalicial layer, which can result in seepage of fluid, be it a crystalloid or a colloid or plasma. That's one of the main problems in sepsis, of course. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. I did not say FFP as a primary fluid of choice. I said the use of FFP along with crystalloids. And one thing, especially when you have a sepsis, uh, 
way which may go in for coagulopathies and things like that in especially the post-operative patients who behave a bit different from a sepsis of uh, uh, other etiology. So in oh, that context, I was telling, I was not as a primary fluid, but a substitution of fresh frozen plasma along with your crystalloids or the other, other mode of management. For example, giving fresh blood. Uh, fresh blood itself uh, means a lot in a sepsis patient to improve so many other uh, 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 signs of in the body. So on that context, I was asking your experience, not as a primary fluid, as an adjuvant. How do you put it that way then, if you have it? Yeah, uh, we honestly, we don't use okay. uh, fresh uh, frozen plasma in that situation unless there is a uh, coagulopathy related bleeding. Then of course, of course, we'll give it freely. And perhaps there is a case in patients with impaired liver function. Uh, in cirrhotic patients with say spontaneous bacterial peptidomitis with impaired coagulation. But otherwise, as a general rule, we wouldn't use fresh frozen plasma in that situation. And uh, uh, fresh blood, of course, there are some studies, of course, recent studies which suggest that it may be preferable to fractionated uh, components of blood. And uh, this, of course, needs to be studied. But the problem is we don't get fresh blood anymore in any of the blood banks, as well as I know. Thank you. Dr. Prakash Raj, did you want to say something? I thought you, I saw your hand up. <clears throat> Dr. Prakash Raj. So, uh, if if uh, there are uh, no more questions or comments, uh, some closing. Uh, okay, there's one more question. Uh, what about use of steroids and management of euthyroid six syndrome and sepsis? Corticosteroids, of course, uh, you would use. There is fairly good evidence to support the use of uh, hydrocortisone uh, in a dose of 50 milligrams six hourly or in a dose of uh, 200 milligrams per day as an infusion, as we have seen with the adrenal study. So, so that is something which you would add as a, a component of the uh, sepsis package in patients with severe sepsis. It has been shown to reduce ventilation days and ICU days, although a mortality difference was not uh, demonstrated in the adrenal trial. In fact, that is something we practice in our patients with severe sepsis as well. Um, so, so much about uh, steroids. What was the other question? New thyroid. Uh, yeah, sick new uh, thyroid syndrome. Uh, generally speaking, you would not intervene particularly in that situation. Uh, it is just part of the part of the uh, acute illness, and you would uh, treat the underlying illness and wait on it. At least that's been our practice. Uh, do you have any closing comments, Dr. Chakra? Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be here and a, a very illuminative talk by all the panelists. I thank them all for joining in. And uh, I hope the audience would have taken home some salient points in terms of what are the goals of resuscitation. Of course, the surviving sepsis guidelines are broad guidelines. They are meant to be that. They are not meant to be used as a one-size-fits-all recommendation. So you will need to obviously be by your patient's bedside, assess your patient time to time, and, and uh, modify your management depending on the response. This, of course, is the role of the ICU physician to be by the bedside, take note of the dynamic changes that happen to the patient and tailor your treatment accordingly. So, so there's a saying in, in critical care, don't just do anything, just be there. So being there is very important. You don't need to do anything special or you don't need to do something just for the sake of doing it. Mm -hmm. I see it drugs cards being filled with pandoprasol and other sorts of uh, uh, junk, if I would use that term, in patients, just for the sake of filling up the drugs card. So that's perhaps one of the examples to suggest that you need not do something just for the sake of doing it. Just be there. That's all of the ICU doctor. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Chako. And I think that's what... Uh... Patara Krishna was trying to thank the intensivist for being there all the time with the patient and uh, 
thank you uh, for joining us despite your busy schedule and uh, thank you sabha and uh, suchitra and uh, hope we'll have some more sessions related to critical care over the coming weeks um, next week we'll be having a talk by uh, dr ramchandran on uh, biomarkers in diabetes uh, so we'll meet you again at 8 pm next saturday till then take care and stay safe good night thanks good night. everyone thank good you again thank Bye. you Bye. Thank you.